I'm going to do a very brief introduction into why we feel that this is an important topic. And I would love for you to answer this question, what is mission and why is it important? Okay, think about that, jot that down, write it in the chat box. What is mission and why is it important? Mission for us as Christians, what we believe, uh, the word mission means send. Okay, so that, that's where the root word comes from. It comes from the word mission, which means to send. And why mission is so important is because we believe we have a missional God. God sent his son to this earth so that we could have a relationship with him, which means that God is fundamentally missional. That, that's part of his personality. It's part of our calling as a church. He also says to us, Jesus says in Matthew 28, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey the commandments that I've given you. And surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. Jesus also says in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I think that this is beautiful for us as Christians. We've spoken about being a disciple, a follower of Jesus means to be upward focused, to worship God, to know God more, to dedicate our lives to him, to be inward focused, being transformed into the likeness of Jesus, but also to be outward focused, to reach out. Okay, as Christians, we have been saved because Jesus died on the cross because of our faith in him, but we've also been invited into this beautiful mission of God, which is to bring people into his kingdom, establish his kingdom, and get people to know him and walk in relationship with him which is beautiful. I'd love it if you guys said amen to that. Amen. So for us as Christians, what we believe is fundamental to our identity as people who follow after God is, yes, we have been saved. Yes, we walk with God. Yes, we have a relationship with him. But we also have the responsibility and the privilege of being part of everything that he's doing in this world, the mission of God, establishing his kingdom, transforming individuals and transforming societies. So what we would like to do in this session is to have a look into that. So how can we as individuals and as the church become more missional in the way that we live our lives and the way that we interact with people around us? So I'm going to hand over to our first panel member, which is Chris, um, and Chris is going to be, yeah, Chris, you introduce your section, um, and yeah, go for it. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, identifying your gifts and um, calling, and also um, about learning to hear from God, um, hear, hear God's voice, and testing the spirit. Now, first and foremost, I just want to begin by thanking God for persisting with me. You will get to know about that, a bit more about that later. And secondly, at every opportunity I get, I have to acknowledge this person, my husband, for his faithful support. For many years, he stood by and, and watched me use our resources to do the things that God was leading me to do. I didn't find it easy, so goodness knows what the sacrifice has been for him. Um, I have been praying about this session for some time and I did get a word from God. Um, and I know it's a word from God because when you're woken up in the night suddenly and you're tired and you can't get back to sleep and some words are rolling in your head and you, you have to get up and write it down because you know is the Holy Spirit speaking to you, then you know it's of God. So if I say nothing else tonight, um, I'm going to deliver this word. It is meant for somebody. Um, the word is, learn to forgive yourself and be willing to forgive others. Then your relationship with me will deepen. That is it. Okay. I'm, I'm done. Bye. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> right. Um, 
I'm not a preacher, so I am going to speak as I find, and I hope that's going to be okay. I'm um, talking about identifying um, your gift and your calling. Well, we all know we have gifts. God has given us all gifts. And what I know is that God will give you the grace to do what he wants you to do. I would like you to just consider um, a, a few things. What is important to you about life? What are you passionate about or interested in? And what are the things that you do well effortlessly? Well, did you know that God has made you special and that he has a purpose for your life? It is important that we confess things, positive things, when God is prompting us to use our gifts, it is easy to feed the fear of the unknown. We may then begin to feed that fear by thinking it's too hard, it won't work, I don't know, I don't have the time. Um, I'll do it when I'm older. I can't afford it. It is not for me, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I know that many of you of you are already using your gifts. But some of us do deny our gifts or ignore our calling. God will give you the grace to use your gift. Romans 12, 6 to 8 will help that. God can also come at an inconvenient time and call you to do what you know nothing about. What it wants us to do is important than what we want to do. We, we really need to get that. God doesn't call the qualified, but it will qualify and equip the called. It will also position people in due season to help you. Um, I believe that we don't need ability to do what God wants us to do. We just need to make ourselves available. So availability is important. That means we must, we must be prepared to surrender, and we must be prepared to sacrifice, and we must be, be ready to serve. So, what are some of the things that stop us? We have stuff of life, confidence, resources, fear of the unknown, other people, or we don't know the full details, et cetera, et cetera. This is where faith comes in, Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not know. Tonight, I want to share with you some of my experiences with God. The young Chris spoke her mind which often got her into trouble. She wasn't afraid of people and their position when it came to truth. My friends would say to each other that if you don't want to hear the truth, don't ask Chris. Now, I just want you to hold that thought for a moment. When God called me to mission in the Gambia in West Africa, it, um, onto what I called the rugged road, it was at a very inconvenient time in my life. My business was less than two years old and it was doing very well. I had just won a government contract to provide address and service um, in an institution and a painful situation in my life was just unraveling. So what did I do? I went into denial. I told God, do you not see what all that I'm dealing with? I don't know anything about what, the, um, what they need in the Gambia. Please send someone else. How did I end up in the Gambia? I reluctantly took advice from an excited travel agent and went to, on a holiday to a place that I didn't know that you could even holiday in. And my whole life changed. I went to Gambia seven times in 2006 and five times the following year. Each time I came home, I could not settle. 
I began to dream instructions. Like I wasn't to like, I wasn't to take them gifts. I was to teach them. I would be woken in the night with words that I didn't even know was scripture until I went and, and looked for it. The more I protested, the more the love and my love and passion for the people grew. And the more I began to see the need of the poor. I also saw that they didn't have a voice, but God knows that I have a voice and I'm not afraid to use it, especially when it came to defending others or telling the truth. God began to shape the qualities that got me into trouble when I was young and now uses them to speak for others in my calling. Now, a lot of hearing from God and listening to God um, has brought what I do in the Gambia for God um, along the way it has done. And the scriptures that come to mind is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to encourage people with these scriptures. Also greater is Christ in me than the, in the world. God said he will send a comforter that is a helper, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener. That's in John 14, 26 to 27. Ask God to fill you daily, Acts 1, 48, tells us to wait and we will receive power. I just love verse 7 because it says it all. It is not for you to know the time and dates the Father has set by his authority. So we need to learn to wait. It is not only in English the Holy Spirit will whisper or touch your heart. He will use scripture, songs. He uses songs with me a lot, and I've um, sent some, some of them to, um, to be put onto the chat. A sermon, another person, dreams, vision, voice, sound, nature. So sometimes we just need to park our intellect through eyes. Ask God for confirmation when you feel he's talking to you. I often ask God to show me, teach me, lead me. God spoke to me in various ways. Some of them I didn't like, but they all always pointed to the core. One particular scripture that he gave me right at the beginning that still helps me to today is 2 Chronicles 20. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast army. The battle is not yours, but God's. Have faith in the Lord, your God, and you will be upheld. Men were appointed to sing praises to the Lord. Isn't that just amazing to win a battle? Sometimes you have to shut the world out. If people around you don't agree with you, it shouldn't mean that you don't do what the Holy Spirit has led you to do. Usually, for me, I don't understand or have the full picture either, but I trust the Holy Spirit and the God in me. And God in me, people mean well. What God has revealed to you won't necessarily make sense to anyone else. So trust the voice within. Ask God for confirmation. Develop discernment. Support and encouragement won't always come from where you expect it. For me, I care about what people have to say, but I don't seek their approval. Galatians 1.10 makes that very clear. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a, um, a servant of Christ. Accept the first steps from your heart and God will start to unravel the rest bit by bit. I start to take the steps with continual prayer. I often take the leap of faith. 
that helped me to develop how to know and how, um, how and when God is talking to me. Even then I would pray, Lord, if it is not of you, stop me. So if someone says to me, God told me to do it, it is not for me to say God didn't. My duty is to pray with and for them. The way of the Lord is foolishness to the natural eyes. The Oasis Project charity, which God led me to establish in 2007, has inspired a community canal that reduced cases of malaria by 74% in the first year. I also was led to start a school in 2014. Day one, we had seven children. We have grown to 243 children and we have a waiting list. God has grown it. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a, a teacher. I had none of the skills that it has taken to establish and for these things to be flourishing. We have um, grade six students now going to secondary school and we have schools wanting to make appointment with us because they want our students in their school. So God is able to do all things. I will finish by saying, we don't talk about the devil much, but the Bible tells us that the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness. So why would he leave us alone? Let's take instruction and encouragement from Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. We need to have spiritual peripheral vision. How often do we say things like, I knew that I should have done that. Something was telling me to do that. And I knew that I knew that was going to happen. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a little bit of time now for feedback and questions. Chris, are you happy to lead that? Um, as you said, it's going to be interactive. I'm interested to hear people's feedback on what the things I had to say or what may have touched some of the things they discussed and um, if they've got any um, questions for me. So, yeah, go for it, guys. Great. So if anybody wants to feedback... Um, yeah, go for it. We don't have a huge amount of people on tonight. So yeah, any questions or any feedback, please go for it. Just unmute yourself. Chris, it's Kathy. Um, I just wondered, where do you start in, in setting up a school, you know, in, in the Gambia when, mm -hmm. You know, I know you're a very able lady, but was it you were completely reliant on God to create the stepping stones for you or? Yes, it was total reliance on God and the preparations God had made, um, made before years because um, I, I founded the charity in 2007 and this was 2013 when I just knew that two words that God had spoken to me in 2008, one of them was about to manifest. And the two words were vision and literacy. And you do, when Holy Spirit is flowing, you just feel. And I, I, I was like walking down the road saying, no, I, I, I can't do that. Um, I'm not a teacher, I, where do you start? And the ministering, the ministering came and in setting up the school, what it's called, um, how I set it up, the way it's run, it's all things God has shown me, has spoken, um, has used other people to come. Um, there is a pastor in the Gambia that God just led me to in 2007 that um, has just he has just prayed over my life and the mission from day one that I met him. And when opposition comes, he prays. And that has warded off so many things. So yes, total reliance on God. Even today, 
Um, if I plan to travel to the Gambia and I know that God is saying no, then I cancel everything. If I have got stuff to do here and I'm feeling God says you need to be there, I drop everything. That's how it is. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, great, thank you. Okay, we have five more minutes with Chris. So if we have any more feedback or questions, please go for it. I think it's quite interesting just how Chris is reflecting on the way that the Holy Spirit leads her. Because I think for me, I, I would say that I have felt the, the Spirit um, working with me and and me being led vocationally to do different things in response to the spirit. But it always feels a lot more kind of like there's a there's a slightly there's almost a slightly gentle flow about 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 things. I, I don't I don't have this kind of you know drop drop everything, start everything kind of dramatic way that 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 Chris is talking about. So I, th I think, but I can absolutely relate 100% to what what Chris is saying about the spirit, but maybe people just seeing how the spirit, I think sometimes just works with us, with our own personalities and who we are quite, quite, quite differently. So for people not to think there's, you know, the spirit only speaks in one, you know, one particular one particular way I think it'll it'll work differently for depending on who we are sometimes yes we, we were saying that very thing in the room I was in that it could be in your everyday life it, and you don't realize that God is using you um so you're quite right Andrew it it comes in many different ways um, and even for me, it's not always in the way I expressed it um, in answering Kathy's question. Right. There are lots of instances that is, um, it's a slight word, like um, we did some eye testing. And it was one morning I woke up and I just heard this gentle whisper in my ear. And I, I was like this, because it was all just weird to me. Um, I, and I just carried on doing what I was doing. But as the day went on, um, it didn't go away and I had to start paying attention to it. And it just built from there. I prayed into it. Um, I, prayer is really so key and, and, and just making the time to sit and, and, and wait and ask, just talking to God. I talk to God like I'm talking to you now. That's, you know, I talk to him all day long, just like I'm talking to you. <laughs> and I think I he wants us to be like that. Chris, I love what you're saying. And, and um, yeah, Andrew, definitely God speaks to all of us in different ways. And that's that's absolutely fine. Um, Chris, behind your head, we can see a picture of um, uh, a, a channel. Um, and um, having been out... Uh, to where your school is myself years ago that channel wasn't there when I was there because this is part of the um, irrigation isn't it just describe to us what that that channel is because I just what I love about what you're saying is that your faith leads to action and that action is a tremendous witness um, you know in that in in the Gambia and uh, and, and that's that, that's how I think your witness as a person and as a charity is, is tremendously powerful. Just describe to everybody what we are looking at in that picture. Yeah, behind me is the canal that God inspired and showed me. Um, I was just woken up one morning in 2010. I was in the Gambia. Um, I, I was out there for six months. I found, I thought it was gonna be really hard because my business, my family, grandchildren, everything was here doing fine and I knew I was going to be sitting in the Gambia in the rainy season for six months 
Um, I was not really impressed, but it was in that time at a moment that I just did not expect that God, it, it just showed me very slightly. It, um, I can't even sort of say that I, it was early morning, about five o'clock in the morning. I sat, I'd woken up and I was going to do my devotional. And I was very clear what I saw and I knew where he was leading me to go. I went to the point and I knew that's where the canal was going to start. People said all sorts of things. How do you know? It God led me to do a sample um, 100 meter length that I paid for to show um, the authorities what was possible to deal with their drainage problem. And they said to me, how did you know to put um, BRC that's used for building and these netting together and it's going to take someone's weight? I said, God showed me. And it took eight years to, for me to find the money to build the canal. God showed me how to write the plan for building this canal. And many said it wouldn't work, it can't do it. Um, but I knew what God said it will do, it will do. And I just persisted to find the money. Um, eight years later, in a lot of work, um, Rotary International um, and a, a, um, a Rotary Club in Milton Keynes um, gave $47,000 to build that can, um, canal behind me. And that's a canal that reduces malaria up to 74% in the community that was just very sick. And I don't, it's not me, it's, it, it's God. Um, I just go and, um, it, it really humbles me. I feel it's a privilege to be doing what I'm doing and it's a responsibility and I, I don't take it lightly. Um, but I don't, I don't make it a big deal either because God will speak and if I'm going wrong, I, I know it will prompt me because I really worked hard at building and at knowing it, um, and just feeling God. It's been years of doing it and practice makes perfect. And I'm not perfect. God is still, I'm still a work in progress every day. And God just, you know, um, I think I said to Peter that um, um, I'm like um, the rudder in a boat. And I said, and God is sitting there and I just tell him to do what he likes with me. <laughs> hi, hi everybody I've got a question for Chris how long does the canal run does it run through a village or a town or it runs into uh, the mangroves it's 400 meters wow and it, is it complete or still working um, it's as complete as it can be in the Gambia <laughs> um it's many we continue to manage the situation with the community um but God is in it and um it, that's a country that's 90 percent Muslim not because the Muslim they're a problem but I'm a Christian that you know so it just says God will send you to help anybody what the, the denominations has nothing to do with it. We, we're all children of God. And he, he will do with, you know, he will send you where he wants to send you. And he just need, we just need to be willing. Um, it doesn't have to be something dramatic like it sent me to do. He, he sends me to do little things here as well, you know, um, with people that he will prompt me to just do stuff for or touch base with and for a reason or whatever. You just quietly go and do it. Right. Sorry, um, just to interrupt really quickly. Um, we have a four minute tea break now. So please do feel free to go and grab something to drink if you want a little bit of a break. Um, we're going to keep Chris on during this break, if that's okay with you, Chris, yeah. uh, because there are a few people asking questions, but um, we do also have a bit of a time limit. So if you want to duck off, grab something to drink, something to eat, please go for it. Um, and we're going to start up in four minutes. Uh, Daryl, if you want to ask your question. I suppose my question is, I'm, still, I'm trying to formulate my question, but this is actually for probably for Chris and for David and Ben when they get around to these sessions, is the missional stuff. Um, I don't know if you can give it a percentage, but would you say like 90% is almost like 
practical and then 10% is Jesus. I, I, what I mean is like, obviously Jesus isn't in it at all, but you need to actually go ahead and get someone to build that, that channel behind you. You need to get a classroom. You need to have them um, like an, an administrative side. You have to have an organizing side. So you have all these, so some of these skills you learn along the way, but I mean, you, you can take a lot of time and you don't really, it's not necessarily having to mention the name of Jesus or talking about Jesus dying on the cross for you. That's like probably the last, not the last thing on your mind, but it's 90%. Sometimes you just go and have, they want water. They need water. They need education. That's what you do. And then the, the other stuff perhaps comes later. I, I don't know how to make that a question, but that's what I wanted to say. Um, I don't know how you can respond. Yeah. Chris. Um, I think I get it. You are right. Um, I don't, I, I think what, I, what I'm well aware of is I'm being watched. And so I am representing Jesus. Mm -hmm. So how I behave, my integrity, all of that is what speaks of God. And I have if, if God tells me something and it's something that I, that's going to happen at another time, I will share it with as many people as possible because when it manifests, in fact, I find that is the people in the Gambia, they'll say to me, Chris, but you said, I said, that's the God I serve. And so that's how I, how God shows himself in the, in what he has sent me to do. Um, and I've seen changes in people, the way they talk. Um, um, at first, I wasn't accepted. It, not just because um, I'm not a Muslim or I don't, I'm not a Gambian, but because I'm a black woman, I was not accepted. They've poisoned me in the Gambia. I keep going back because God sent me. And now that has brought a respect that they see that I'm not there to exploit them. I'm actually um, enhancing um, and empowering them. And they know they know from day one that um, God of Jesus Christ sent me to do that. Cool. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, can everyone give Chris a round of applause? on your things. That was brilliant. Well done, Chris. Well done. Thank you so much for sharing and your incredible, there we go, your incredible story and your incredible journey. And, and I think you are an absolutely exceptional person and, oh, yeah. and your ability to hear from God and to respond, because I think most of us do hear from God and we do listen, but it's that going and that giving up and that sacrifice that's so so difficult so well done for doing that and um, but just speaking to everybody else like i think what i get from you whenever i speak with you and we took a long walk the other day is that we're reminded that god doesn't call exceptional people even though you're exceptional but we serve an exceptional god so we see these incredible things happening and God just invites us to be a part of that incredible work. So don't feel like you've got imposter syndrome because you're not being called to the Gambia, um, but we're all called and we, we serve an incredible God. So I'm going to hand over to David McDougall now. He's going to lead us in some personal evangelism. Great, we're going to change tack. I'm going to uh, challenge myself. I'm turning my mobile phone on and putting it to a five minute start button now because my challenge is to speak to you for five minutes and for then you to talk to each other in small groups for 10 minutes. So here we go. Uh, Ephesians uh, 5, 15 and 16 and Colossians 4, 5 and 6 talks uh, about taking up the opportunity uh, that we can it says be careful then how you live not as unwise but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil and it says exactly the same in, in colossians it says be wise in the way you act towards outsiders make the most of every opportunity and then it says let your conversation always be full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone for a few moments we're going to think about 
uh, personal evangelism now because God does want us to share our faith. And in Luke 10, it talks about Jesus sending out the 72. And it says this, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among the wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, uh, first say peace to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking, whatever they give you for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around the, from house to house. And it goes on to say, if, if you discover as you're moving in your life, as you're talking with people in your life, if you discover a person of peace, Jesus is saying, stay there. And the great news about personal evangelism is it's also saying, if the person is not a person of peace and they don't really want to listen to you sharing your faith, that's okay. You can just graciously move on. But actually, let's move on and, and share our faith naturally, beautifully with other people. Of course, our witness is through how we love, how we live, how we listen, how we serve, how we how we dig canals. It's all sorts of ways. But God does ask us to share our faith. And it's quite a challenge to us as English people, I think, particularly because I think we're quite private. I've traveled around the world. It's been a privilege. And I found other nations that are much more able and willing and enthusiastic to share their faith. And sometimes English people are a little bit private, but God does want us to share our faith. So when you find a person of peace, Jesus is saying, spend time with them. Don't judge them before you've actually tried to share your faith with them. And Jesus has got a strategy here. He's saying, speak a blessing of peace on someone. And if they reject it, move on. Uh, and if they receive it, stay with them. And so it's liberating to know that we don't have to keep sharing faith with people who don't want to listen. We don't have to bombard people, do we? It's wrong anyway to do that. And um, so what does peace uh, upon this house look like today? Well, it might be that actually in our conversations, naturally, with people as we walk the dog with them or as we share a coffee with them, now we can, um, we could ask them spiritual questions and you'll soon find out whether they're a person a peace or not? A question like, do you feel close or far away from God? Might just open up a spiritual conversation. Or what has, your been, what has been your spiritual experience in the past? Have you got any spiritual experiences that, you know, you could just share with, with me? I've, I've definitely used that one. Or something I've often used is, you know, is there anything, you know, that I can pray for? Or I'll pick up from the conversation things that they're really worried about. And I'll say, I'll really, you know, I'd love to pray for you on that and if you can sense actually they're a person of peace then spend more time with them and actually take them on a journey with you invite them maybe to a christian gathering or your home group or to alpha if they're at that stage where they they might take it even further or to a sunday service or to the connections cafe down at, at the community center or oasis in the community center or to a ch children's event or to a young people's event tell stories of what you've done in your life and try to tell recent stories, not just the ancient stories, and maybe have a go as the relationships naturally develop to tell stories, um, the, sorry, to tell the gospel story in, in a way that is a non-jargon way so that people actually um, do, you know, can understand what the heck you're talking about. And that's seven seconds to go, so I'm cancelling my phone and we're going to go into breakout rooms um, because one of the feedbacks we've got is that actually we, we want more time in breakout rooms than we do want to listen to people talking. So you'll find the questions, uh, join a, a, a chat room now and we'll see you again in 10 minutes. Great, well I hope you enjoyed uh, being uh, in a small group and talking about some of those things. We've, we've really listened to your feedback about um, having a bit more time in, in, in small groups than actually listening to people. So I'm going to start my five minute counter again so that I don't actually speak for more than five minutes. Here we go. So I'm starting that again and it'll, it'll uh, peep on me when I have to shut up. But Jesus was instructing uh, the 72 
and he was saying, bring a blessing of, of peace um, to a home. And uh, he said they were, he said that the 72, they were to eat the food um, that was offered. They were to talk about the kingdom of God, if you look at that scripture. And they were to uh, pray for the sick, pray for the healing of the sick. Three specific things, eat the food, talk about the kingdom of God, and uh, pray for the sick. It was interesting that actually one of the things that we were talking about in our group was actually we might say, you know, what's going on in your life? What can we pray for? And that prayer might be something that might open up a, um, a good spiritual conversation. And Jesus was explaining his strategy by doing that. Eat, eat together, declare the kingdom of God together and pray for the sick. That was his strategy, if you like, for personal evangelism that we can see in the scriptures. And he's really encouraging us to not give up. Perhaps you've had a lot of experiences where you haven't come across people of peace and actually you've come across the opposite and they've people don't really want to listen to you about your faith. Uh, and that may have stopped you altogether. And that's really sad. And I think that the whisper might be to us tonight is, no, keep going because somebody with your personality in the way that you'll share your faith, which is different to anybody else, there are people out there that really might need to actually spend time with you and um and they and you know that they may find jesus because of you which is really really important so spending time with people is really really important and that requires discernment as to who and it's and it it requires persistence uh, and patience um and jesus as the good shepherd you know he knows how to lead people back to the father and we need to, to learn what our part in the journey of that is. There was a prophetic word in the morning prayers just a few days ago about the uh, prodigals coming home. And actually, I do believe that we need to be out there uh, and bringing the lost sheep and, and guiding them back in, into the fold. People maybe for the first time, but also uh, people who've, who, who've been lost through all the dif difficulty that's going on. And Jesus does say in Mark 1.17, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. I will help you to become fishers of people. The work of personal evangelism is not short term. It's a long term process, and it involves the sharing of our whole lives, uh, helping people to, to take steps forward in faith. And we can see it um, a bit like stepping stones across a stream, just taking one stone at a time, just helping, guiding people across that stream very gently. And we're offering ourselves to God uh, to help encourage our person of peace to take another step across the river. I have to say that Ben has been a great uh, example to me of this while I've been around in Bletchley. He, he, he's talked to me quite a lot about people of peace and, uh, and, and St. Joe's are very good at this. And I think God wants us to be, or all of us to be better at this. And when someone responds positively to our, our attempt to bless them, uh, we, we might begin to discover their openness to God and we might know they're a person of peace and therefore we can actually take that a bit further. Down on my allotment, um, people want to talk and I, I listen a lot. I listen far more than I talk about my faith, but because of the huge amount of conversations that I have down the allotment, I, I am able to share my faith and actually some are listening and it's very, very exciting. But you know, I'm on my allotment regularly uh, and, and, and that's what it takes actually to build relationships, to actually regularly spend time with, with people. Just recently I did a funeral for one of our neighbors and uh, I was invited to the wake and I went to the wake because I wanted to spend time and eat with them and mourn with them and also listen to them. And you know, I, apart from once in 35 years of ministry, I've often said can I pray for you and only once do I ever remember somebody saying that they didn't want me to do that and they had a specific reason because they, they were part of a, of, a, of a group that didn't like prayer and so all of the other times when I've offered prayer I, I've actually been received and able to pray for people so where you share life and you can enjoy a deepening friendship where you can spiritually talk together, where you can invite them to pursue faith, perhaps by going to Alpha. And now my, my buzzer's gone, so I've just got to stop it buzzing on me. 
before you go into the, the next group, which because I've run out of time, I want you to think of one person that you might open a spiritual conversation with. I'd love you to text them and invite them to have a walk with you or a coffee with you in the coming weeks and months. I'd love you to take this into some kind of action, in other words. And when we step across social boundaries and introduce spirituality into our friendships, it can be difficult, but it can bring people to God and it can pe open people up to God. So uh, let's go into our small groups now. And um, I've, I've given you some more questions uh, to just to think through this. And I want you to look at Luke 19, verse 1 to 10. So have a Bible handy. Great. Thank you so much for sharing, David. And welcome back, everybody. We are now going to hand over to Ben. So welcome, Ben, and over to you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Just woken up. So <clears throat> there we go. Uh, right. So uh, I think I'm just waiting for my uh, my face to pop up. There we go. Hello. Uh, so I'm doing something that doesn't contradict what David just said. I promise. <laughs> I promise it doesn't contradict it at all. But it's a different take on a, a similar topic because I have such a heart, such a heart for the gospel to be to be known further and wider and for people who don't know Jesus to know Jesus. But I would not say that I am a, a an evangelist. So if that's you too, I have some good news for you. Uh, you don't have to be. And yet there is something important to share. Who does Jesus say is the light of the world in Matthew 5? Just with yourself muted, you can just say it. Who does he say is the light of the world? You. You. You are the light of the world. But he doesn't say you single. OK, he doesn't say you singular. This is one of those anomalies about it being written in a different language and we get it as it is. I think the, the Americans would do well with this to actually say, it would say y'all. Y'all are the light of the world because you all, plural, are the light of the world. Who does Paul say is the, uh, is the new temple of God in 1 Corinthians? Again, he says you, you are the temple of God, but it's not you singular, it is you plural together are the temple of god okay look i would uh, maybe i'm off on a rant here but i think the project of individualism in the uh, uh, in the western civilization is failing us hyper individualism is everywhere and i believe that we are the most lonely and individualized society in human history and we know uh, we must know that we can see it everywhere we go, that there are people longing, desperate for real community, not just a sense of community, but actual community. And I think that's where we might have something to say to the world. So John 13, 34 to 35, and, and, and maybe I'll get stuck in the chat, but uh, I'm just going to say this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Right. This is this is pinnacle moment. It's just before everything's about to kick off and the uh, and the Garden of Gethsemane. And then and then we know what happens. Good Friday and onwards. So just before that, what's he going to say to his disciples? What is it going to be? Verse 34 and 35. I'm going to do it from the message. It's a very similar translation in the NIV. Let me give you a new command, Jesus says. Love one another. In the same way I loved you, you love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love you have for each other. Okay, so yes, of course, personal evangelism, and yes, witness away day to day wherever God gives you that leading to do it. But what are we inviting people to? What is the gospel? And I don't mean are we inviting them to Alpha or church service. That is sometimes absolutely right. What is the gospel invitation to? It's an invitation to be part of the kingdom of God. 
to be part of the family of God, not just now, but into eternity. You know what? At no point can we detach uh, the gospel from the reality of community and fellowship. OK, that might sound like the introverts, might but we are created in the image of a God who is three in one, who is community epitomized. We are to be together. And I'm sorry, I am broken record central. Uh, this is all I ever seem to talk to you guys about at St. Mary's. But what did I say last time I preached uh, with you guys? I, I mentioned uh, Genesis 2. The first, it is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. We are built for community because that is where we're headed. So the call now for us is to begin to live, however imperfectly, in fellowship and in deep belonging to this family of God. And, and, and yeah, it is imperfect. <laughs> so, but look, we can't have God without it. It's, a, it's an all or nothing deal. If you want God, you've got me for eternity. I'm sorry. I feel like we should give a moment's silence just to let that sink in. But I haven't got the time. So if we call to genuine Christian community built on the practice of living and loving like Jesus in that passage that we just heard, how on earth are we to witness to that without actually living it? If that's the call, we've got to actually be living it. What was it? Verse 35. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples. When they see the, the love that you have for each other. And how are they going to see that if they're not invited into that community somehow and in some way? It's what our world desperately needs. Real community and belonging. Right. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask for a breakout room. Um, Peter, could it be just... Uh, let, let's go quickly on this one. Let's do uh, three minutes. Three minutes. And the question is this. You don't need to look at your sheet. It is just, are you excited by that or are you horrified by that? Go. Apologies for those who, who uh, uh, needed more time. I'm sorry. We will come back to breakout rooms in a minute. I just wanted to, uh, uh, to give you a chance to start to process <laughs> this news that we are built for community, that we're called to it uh, for, for eternity, but to start living it out now. And I, I know that that's quite scary for, for some um, because church can, can hurt sometimes, can't it? So I think there are, there are some certain ingredients that, that we, we need to have in the mix here if we're going to... Um, um, if we're going to do this community thing well and then to accept other people into that i think first of all we need a group that is committed to loving each other just as jesus did okay so i'm not talking here today i want to give you some tools to actually be able to go away and start to do this tomorrow if you wanted to and it doesn't require the whole church to be involved just a group of you who are committed to loving each other just as Jesus did. Maybe that's in your home group. You then need another thing in common. You need regular shared diary space. You can't do community properly if you're not in each other's presence. I'm sorry. It, you, it's got to be money where your mouth is kind of a moment here. You're going to walk the walk. Let's not just talk about it anymore. Actually start to spend time with each other, to regularly meet for food, to regularly do something together in the week outside of those formal settings, which are lovely. Church settings are great. But are you doing community outside of that? Because you, you're going to need to. And then thirdly, you need the open doors to others who don't know Jesus. We cannot create Christian ghettos. Remember what he said. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples. When they see the love that you have for each other, how can they see that if they're not also invited? So 
let me unpack that a little bit if I can. This is not a call to do more because some of you are hearing that and thinking, how on earth am I supposed to fit that in with everything else that's going on? This might be a call to change your rhythms of how you're doing life currently. But it's it's don't do more, do smarter. So uh, for those of you who know St. Joseph's, we're a church down in Newton Lees and we're trying to do things differently down here. And uh, that's one of our mottos. Don't don't do more, do smarter. Uh, and we are trying to basically there's there's a lovely little book called Family on Mission um, um, by uh, Mike Breen. And and in that, it talks about uh, trying to trying to juggle life and everything else and say, you know, is it family or mission? And that's been the way for vicars down the generations. Uh, fa family or mission. Well, I've got to basically choose one or the other. Maybe my calling is to the to the church and and screw my family. Well, no, it's not that. So then people went, well, maybe it's family and mission. And, and I've got to try and do everything. Well, that's that's burnout, my friends. And we've seen that before. Family on mission it's taking the family with you and i believe that doesn't just mean your nuclear family i think that means us as a church community as well what would it look like for us to go on mission together just where we are don't do more do smarter so here's some thoughts don't host get that word out of your head especially you middle class lot all right you know what it looks like to say okay i've got to get everyone in and i've got to put on a dinner party we're not talking about dinner parties all right save that for another day we're talking baked beans on toast we're talking bring and share where everyone just brings something and it's messy at the table and it's messy on the counter but people are getting stuck in it's saying someone else can load your dishwasher it's saying someone else can help you get the kids to bed it's all of these things and more and it's saying uh let's not do more let's just do what we were doing anyway but do it together what about community in the humdrum you know you go to the shops don't you well what would it look like to go with somebody else to do the food shop maybe share a car and do it together or to go out into town and because you need to get, get some shoes do do it with someone else what what about your errands what about your gardening getting a group of you to do it all at the same time it's just thinking about community and everything then what about this who else can you invite ask that question regularly who else could be invited to what we're doing you know think about this okay pre-covid i know it's been a long time but it's coming back you are going to be able to go out. You're going to be able to go back to the pub. You're going to be able to do barbecues and cinema trips and walks and all the others. And maybe, I don't know about you, I, I would do this quite a lot where you'd say, right, come on, uh, that, that group of friends or, or that family, we're going to do something together. Again, ask the question, who else could I invite? Bring other people in constantly. That's what God does constantly he is constantly looking for others to bring in so we should do the same and the point of this is actually you don't have to start to separate your christian life from your your real world life does that make sense because so often i've seen it happen where where christians learn how to do christian stuff with christian people at christian times normally 7 30 in the evening that's very christian o'clock but and then you do other things with your non-christian mates uh, and that's that's completely separate let's let's remember that god's called us to one life so what would it look like to join that up together I've got a friend uh, who's married to someone who doesn't know Jesus. And I remember we were over for a takeaway and we're having a lovely time and talking this, that and the other. And then the husband got up to go to the loo. And it was at that point that she suddenly splurted out all this stuff about what God's been doing in her life. And I was like, why are you telling me now when your husband's not in the room? We get so scared sometimes. And I get that too. But what does it look like? Remember. You are the light of the world, but you are the salt of the, of the world as well. And I think it was David who mentioned it earlier about the seasoning, your conversation. Sometimes it's not actually that we want the flavor to be salt. We want, we want to season it. 
So we learn how to actually just start to live a life which is authentically Christian, which is authentically us. And when we're gathered at St. Joe's with people of faith and people who aren't really sure about their faith and other people who are just in on the meal because we've invited them in and they're up for being part of community. And then the conversation just turns around to one of the things that we do around the meal table, which is we say, what are you thankful for? And everyone before they uh, tuck into the food has to say one thing that they're thankful for. And you can't say something that someone else has said. And, and just by doing that, we're seasoning the conversation. We're not saying thankful to God. I mean, clearly we are. But we're allowing other people in on that too and just see where it goes. One light. OK, that's, this is my final one before we go back to a breakout room. One light, just you on your own, can be a beautiful thing up in the sky have you ever seen just where you see one star there and, and you're just like oh, that looks beautiful isn't that awesome but what about a sky full full of magnificent stars and light i think that's what god's calling us to he wants us to be part of that great display of his majesty and we can only do that if we are together if we are as jesus said this is how everyone will recognize that you're my disciples when they see the love you have for each other. I'm going to shut up. There's so much more I could have said, so much more I could have said, and I've had to cram it all in. So apologies if, if any of that hasn't quite flowed as well as I wanted it to. But we're going to go back to the breakout room for another five minutes. Uh, and in this, I, I'm just asking this yeah but finish the sentence yeah but dot 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 so come up with some reasons why you think well what would you say in response to that and then maybe in your group you can start to try and answer that question as well if someone says yeah but what about this then have a go and see what you think just for five minutes great thank you so much ben um and thank you everybody for joining this evening uh, that's everything that we have planned for tonight i hope that you enjoyed it and i hope that you took a lot from it um let's just give our panelists a round of applause quickly yay thanks so much guys that was very very like daryl said flip that was cool okay getting the south african accent in there a little bit um but yeah, that was really, really brilliant. And I hope everybody that you took something from this and that, yeah, you can contextualize it, apply it into your context. Know that you are called and that, yeah, uh, called into a beautiful, beautiful mission of God. Next month, we are going to be having a session on work, life, faith, balance. So forming healthy boundaries and living life in balance um so it'll be great to have you there we're also rethinking what are our next few kind of word and spirit sessions going to be because we are coming to an end of the planned ones next month so please if you have any ideas or if you want to us to speak on something and put a panel together please do send that, those through to me um, and we're going to put them together so i'm going to close off in prayer and have an amazing evening. Father God, thank you so, so much that you are a God who invites us to be part of your family, but also to live that out in our communities and within our world and within our areas of influence. I pray that as we go out into the mission field, our families, our homes, our communities, our schools, our workplaces, our allotments, our neighborhoods and our digital platforms, that you will use us we surrender our lives to you and we pray, Father God, that you will just empower us, speak to us and use us. We're yours, Father. Pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. And good night.